All right, I'm gonna kill my mic. Take a look at the deepest yearning of civilization's builders, and you will see the yearning for paradise. A desperate longing to recover the lost golden age. For the Egyptians, this was the revered golden age of Ra. For the ancient Sumerians, it was the golden age of An. A theme reverberating around the world. But now look at the deepest fears of the same peoples, and you will see the doomsday anxiety. Terror of the Great Catastrophe. This is not an isolated memory, but a memory inseparably linked to the theme of the ancestral paradise. The remembered events were not just catastrophic, they were the events that brought the Golden Age to an end. When the sky was overrun by chaos, Two seemingly incompatible motives trace to a common experience, and both bring us back to the one story told around the world. Hence, the implication cannot be avoided. Something extraordinary was remembered by the first Sky Watchers. Something profound and yet unexplained. In the course of these submissions, trying to maintain a sense of direction, the chronology, the physical evidence, dynamics, all of these issues intertwine. Moreover, various individuals exploring catastrophist ideas will work from different perspectives and will hold different ideas as to what constitutes the most solid ground for a starting point. The solid ground in David Talbot's orientation to these things is the substratum of human memory. It is this substratum that raises the deepest historical questions and sends us scurrying about to find answers, even if the answers upset various specialists, asking them to reconsider the most fundamental assumptions of their discipline. My own conclusion came as a great surprise. The substratum of human memory is incredibly dependable, but others would consider that to be a losing proposition out of the gate. So there's an immediate problem of communication. Just to avoid misunderstanding, Jungian collective memory, though Jungian archetypes may indeed come into the equation in a bigger picture, for now, I mean the common mythical, symbolic, and ritual themes of widely separate cultures. Another way of putting it might be points of agreement concerning remembered events. In this inquiry, I think there are certain things we can all agree on. The truth is unifying because it eliminates contradiction. When you are looking for the truth of a matter, any significant and incontrovertible fact is good news, because it can save you from heading in the wrong direction. It's particularly good news if it compels you to change your mind, because in doing so, it has liberated you from a burden that could only grow. When it comes to the more fundamental errors, a whole lifetime could be spent on a dead end. Once, the world was quite a different place. In the beginning, we were ruled by the central luminary of the sky, the motionless sun, presiding over an age of natural abundance and cosmic harmony, creator king, the father of kings, the founder of the kingship rites. And this earliest remembered time was the exemplary epoch, the golden age, the standard for all later generations. But the ancient order was disrupted, and the entire cosmos fell into confusion. And we're still in confusion. We are an upside-down species with amnesia. When the universal monarch tumbled from his appointed station, then the hordes of chaos were set loose, and all of creation slipped into a cosmic night. The gods themselves battling furiously in the heavens. And yet, from this descent into chaos, a new world emerged, now reconfigured, but with the universal monarch himself. 
rejuvenated and transformed, assuming his rightful place in the heavens. The truth can be demonstrated by following certain rules. Call these our rules for re-envisioning human history. Our first rule is we will always work from the general motif to the specific. A second is only broadly reoccurring themes count as evidence, particularly in the early stages of the reconstruction. And there is a third rule. Earlier recorded versions of the reoccurring themes must be permitted to explain later variants. Okay, just one more rule. We must allow ancient drawings to illuminate the myths and rites, while permitting the myths and rites to illuminate the drawings. This last rule is crucial because around the world ancient sky gazers drew remarkably similar pictures of things that do not exist in our skies today. And the things depicted are the subjects of the myths and rites, though this vital truth has not been generally recognized, either by catastrophists or by mainstream scholars. I mean, mainstream, just forget about it. They would just dismiss this out of hand. You know, Jupiter what? Saturn what? Let's take one story a step further, and how many archetypal figures of myth are there? There are seven. I say with smug assurance, well, there are just seven. But it all depends on how you count these guys and gals. For openers, we know there is at least one archetypal figure because he is the god whose ancient name was One. The primeval, all-encompassing unity. This figure is, of course, the Universal Monarch. The subject of our One story, so our One story might be subtitled The Story of One. Examples would include Egyptian Atum and Ra, Sumerian An and Yutu, Akkadian Anu and Shamash, Hindu Varuna and Brahma, Greek Uranos and Kronos, Aztec Omitiatl and Quetzalcoatl, to name a few. Our claim is that all other stories, all other archetypal figures when investigated at the core, lead back to the one story intersecting with this story in the most remarkable and explicit ways. Here are the other figures. The Queen of Heaven. Wherever you find the Universal Monarch, you will find, close at hand, the ancient Mother Goddess, the goddess whom the Sumerians called Inanna. The Queen of Heaven, and the Babylonians Ishtar, and the Egyptians Isis, Hathor, and Sekhmet, each with numerous counterparts in their own and in other lands, and virtually all of them viewed symbolically as daughter or spouse of the Creator King and the mother of another equally prominent figure, the warrior hero. This is the great national hero, originally the Demiurge, the servant of the Creator King, but passing into later myth as the laboring warrior, messenger, or servant of a great chief or regional ruler. He is the Hercules archetype, a figure combining knowledge and brutish strength. Quick wit and episodic foolishness. He defeats the chaos monsters in the primordial times, and he reconfigures the world with a personality clearly dominating the later mythical chronicles. The warrior hero is the prototype of the famous tricksters and buffoons of later myth and folklore. Flowering into thousands of tribal variations, Egyptian Shu, Horus, and Sept, Sept, Akkadian, Nurgle, Hindu Indra, Norse Thor, Greek Ares, Hercules, the Aztec, Huitzilopochtli, I finally got that one down. Also in North America, Coyote and Raven, but countless others as well. Because the warrior hero is far and away the most active figure in the myths. Next is the Primal Seven. These satellite figures are presented in a variety of contexts as wise men, patriarchs, seers, children, dwarves, stones of fate, stars, orbs, heads of chaos monster, 
They are the first reason for the sanctity of the number seven in ancient symbolism. Then we have the Chaos Monster. Here we meet the darker, more menacing powers possessing the often hidden link to aspects of the Mother Goddess or Warrior Type Hero, Warrior Hero Type. Of these darker creatures, none is more prominent than the Cosmic Serpent or Dragon, the monster that descends on the world to preside over the twilight of the gods, and whose ultimate defeat signals the birth of a new age, or symbolically, a new year. Babylonian Tiamat, Egyptian dragon of Apep, Greek Typhon, but within every culture endless variations will be found, hundreds of monsters, repeating the primeval catastrophe, each providing a different nuance, a different accent, a different way of remembering the cosmic agent of Doomsday. Then we have Chaos Hordes. These are the companion of the monster figures. They are the swarming powers of disorder and calamity, the friends of darkness. Flaming, devouring demons, which so many magical rites were contrived to ward off. From the Norse Valkyries, to the Greek Aranes, from the Babylonian Pazuzu, Pazuzu, demons to the Egyptian fiends of Set. Every culture remembered the onslaught of these chaos demons, moving across the heavens as a, a sky-darkening cloud and ushering in the cosmic night. In their earliest expressions, they do not just announce the primeval catastrophe, they are the catastrophe. Then we have the rejuvenated creator king. Lastly, there is the compelling personality of the dying god king, often a resurrected or transformed figure whose spring back to life is reflected in the dramas of the new year, symbolically, the passing from one age to another. Though his identity is inseparably tied to the universal monarch, he nevertheless emerges in distinction from that god as his son the younger version, or rejuvenated form of his own father. The examples would include the Egyptian Osiris, Akkadian, Marduk, the Persian Ahura, Mazda, Norse Baldur, Hebrew Yahweh, Phoenician Bel, Greek Zeus. So there are just seven archetypal personalities of myth, if you count them in this way. We are not separating the chaos monster into its male-female aspects, so we count only one monster. We are separating the universal monarch into his elder and younger versions, however. End of part one. We arrive, therefore, at our first critical juncture, an acid test. Can a mere seven categories actually encompass all of world mythology? While there are numerous complexities and ambiguities to slow us down periodically, the vast majority of well-documented regional figures of myth can be readily identified in terms of these archetypes, and the implications are quite astounding if you set this principle beside the different theories offered to explain myth in the past. Not a single theory proposed before Velikovsky opened the door will account anymore. for the archetypes, the bedrock of myth. <laughs> the implications become all the more astounding when you begin to see that each of the archetypal figures is linked in no uncertain terms to the one story. I'll give some key examples in the next few submissions. The universal structure to ancient memory is present. The six additional biographies retell the story of one, but each with a slight turn of the prism, putting the focus on a particular aspect of the story and providing more colorful action and detail. What an amazing principle, if true. Of all the skills that the independent researcher might bring to his inquiry. None will prove more crucial than, than that of pattern recognition. There is structure to myth, structure that has never been sufficiently acknowledged. Structure implies coherence and integrity between the parts. Clearly, human imagination must have gone wild to have produced the incredible vistas of the ancient mythscape. But structure is there too, and structure means that human imagination was not operating in a vacuum. 
What could have unleashed human imagination in this way, while yet inspiring a universal myth? Nothing less than the most awesome and traumatic experiences in human history, I would say. And that was by Dave Talbot. I ran into it just surfing around on this page that you'll find a link to in the description. And it's a uh, Saturn Theory overview. It's called Thoth. Some early Talbot from 97. The theory holds that a unique congregation of planets preceded the planetary system, familiar to us today. For earthbound witnesses, the result was a spectacular, at times highly unified apparition in the heavens, the obsessive focus of human attention around the world. For more than 20 years, Dave claimed that this fear-inspiring image once stretched across the northern sky towering over ancient star worshippers. He termed this planetary arrangement the polar configuration because it was centered on the north celestial pole, and he proposed that the history of this configuration is the history of the ancient gods recorded in the fantastic stories, pictographs, ritual reenactments of the first star worshippers. A vast field of data is therefore available to the investigator. Remarkably, similar pictures of a sun in the sky revealed no similarity to our sun today. A pictographic crescent placed on the orb of the sun and a radiant star placed squarely in its center. The Universal Chronicles of the Cosmic Mountain, a pillar of fire, a light rising along the world axis, the myth of a central sun or a motionless sun at the celestial pole, identification of this ancient sun with the planet Saturn. In early astronomies, a radiant city or temple of heaven providing the prototype for their sacred habitation of Earth. The global memories of a star goddess with long flowing hair, an angry goddess raging across the sky with wildly disheveled hair, threatening to destroy the world, a flaming serpent or dragon disturbing the celestial motions or attacking the land. An ancestral warrior or hero born from the womb of the star goddess to vanquish the chaos serpent or dragon. Is it even possible that such diverse motifs could have a unified explanation? One fact remains uncontested after many years of publishing on this subject. The hypothesized planetary configuration does predict or account for hundreds of ancient themes never before explained. And at a level of detail or specificity, ah, there it is, specificity, there it is, at a level of detail or specificity, specificity that could not be denied. Indeed, I have gone so far as to brashly claim not a single general motif or ancient myth, ritual, or symbolism is left unexplained in the most straightforward way by the model. And that's what I mean when I say the model supports a general theory of ancient symbolism as a whole. It needs to be emphasized, therefore, that the historical argument for the polar configuration is fully testable against a massive historical record of nonsense. And I would hope that this will provide some assurance to those unnerved by the source material, ancient testimony. If the model is fundamentally incorrect, the experts on ancient myth and symbolism will have no trouble whatsoever refuting it. Find Gloria, author of the recently published book Red Earth and White Lies, that Ted told me about when I talked to him, has asked a couple of questions which I would like to address, but not in one shot because the questions are too fundamental for that. I'd like to see if I can divide the issues into segments that could make for useful discussion. The Saturn theory arose from a historical argument in the sense that the argument relates to the human past as implied by the details of human memory in ancient times and by human artifacts. 
I shall offer this series of summaries as an exercise in clarifying the historical argument without the aid of visual presentation. One obvious and immediate question is whether something is as ambiguous as myth could actually qualify as evidence. The historical argument focuses on points of agreement in the memories of widespread races, suggesting levels of coherence, often missed by historians and anthrop anthropologists, and raising the possibility that this coherence arises from a core of human experience that has been missed as well. There is an overarching idea in this argument. We've not only misunderstood the past, we failed to recognize the consistency of ancient memory in pointing to extraordinary events never considered by modern science. John Cook said in his writings, mainstream science would have us believe that in the last two to four thousand years, nothing has happened. Remarkably, every motive of our early ancestors directs our attention to experiences impossible to comprehend in terms of any natural phenomena occurring today. This consistency will be seen even at the most fundamental levels of human memory and the most deeply rooted theme of the first civilization. The universal memory of a former age of the gods. The universal memory of an ancestral golden age, inaugurating the age of the gods. The universal memory of a celestial king of the world whose life inspired the ancestral leap into civilization. Descriptions of the gods as luminaries of immense size and power, wielding weapons of thunder and stone, the universal claim that the ancient world evolved by critical phases or cycle, punctuated by sweeping catastrophe. <laughs> Global traditions of gods and heroes ruling for a time then departing amid terrifying spectacles and upheavals. The frequently stated transfiguration of the departed gods into distant stars, the identification of these ruling gods with planets in the first astronomies, the relentless urge of star worshippers to draw pictures of celestial forms never seen in the sky, their desperate yearning to recover the semblance of a lost cosmic order, their collective efforts to replicate in architecture, the towering forms claimed to have existed in primeval times, their festive recreations. Through mystery plays and symbolic rites of cosmic violence and disorder, their reputation through ritual sacrifice of the deaths or ordeals of the gods, of the gods, their brutal and ritualistic wars of expansion, celebrated as a reptilian or as a repetition of the cosmic devastation wrought in wars of the gods, the gods. Motives as these constitute, in fact, the most readily verifiable underpinnings of ancient ritual, myth, and symbol. How strange that in their incessant glance backwards, the builders of the first civilizations never remembered anything resembling the natural world in which we live. What is needed in the face of usual but widely repeated memories is brutal intellectual honesty. Amen Ra. How did human consciousness emerge from the womb of nature, converge on the same improbable ideas contradicting nature? For centuries we've lived under the illusion that our ancestors simply made up explanations of natural phenomena they didn't understand. That's not the problem. What the myth makers interpreted or explained through stories and symbols and ritual reenactments is an unrecognizable world, a world of alien sights and sounds, of celestial forms of cosmic spectacles and earth-shaking events that do not occur in our world. That is the problem. From an evaluation of the global themes of ancient cultures, we have hypothesized a world order never imagined by mainstream theory, a world in which planets moved on different courses, appearing huge in the sky. Heavens spanning celestial forms dominated human imagination to the point of obsession at the time of civilization's birth. Our contention will be that hundreds of ancient themes speak for a unified experience, an experience more specific in context and detail than any of us had ever imagined when we started our research. No universal theme stands alone or in isolation from any of the others. All are connected. All speak for the presence of coherent memory beneath the surface of seemingly random detail. 
in offering these summaries, and I'm not asking sure or you expecting anyone to embrace the extraordinary theory back, right? of planetary okay. history involved, only to consider highly interesting evidence that it is. Where merely discovering the active memory will throw a remarkable new light on the ancient structures of human consciousness. In the course of these summaries, questions and challenges will be welcomed and yeah, no rush. Possible, I just want to make sure. To incorporate these into the narrative as we go along, said David Talbot. And then it continues. A different aspect of the same story. That's what I was looking for. Corroboration, but not in verbatim. The story of the one. Some early Talbot from 97. Oh, that's fun. That's cool. other nearby planets, or sub-dwarf stars. Worlds with an opposing negative electrical potential with respect to Saturn would be attracted into resonant alignment during these close encounters. Eventually several planets, including Earth, Venus, and Mars, were steered and captured into an interplanetary configuration centered on Saturn. As planets locked in polar resonance with Saturn, they were simultaneously trapped in a second-order resonance with Jupiter and with each other. The Nice model suggests that when the system naturally evolved into a configuration in which the giant planets were locked in a quadruple resonance, the planets had to move in parallel to preserve the resonant configuration. All in all, according to David Talbot, the entire planetary configuration moved through a gaseous envelope extending perhaps several million miles from Jupiter. Jupiter was the apparent source of an interplanetary vortex within the gaseous envelope, a vortex powerful enough to bring the participating planets into alignment and to maintain the alignment in the face of the natural forces working against it. Incorporating all other gods who came near, Hesiod said, Kronos swallowed all his children but Zeus, intending to prevent the kingship of the gods from passing to any other of the majestic sons of heaven. Nice models and Saturnian scenarios alike have proposed that Uranus and Neptune also became integral components in the temporary stability of the planet's multi-resonant configuration. Inside the configurations encompassing magnetopause, the fixed stars would have been obscured by a cloudy, aurora-like phosphorescence. At the apex of this gloomy or rainy cave-like canopy stood the large central sun-like disk of hot, inflated proto-Saturn. Fragmentary memories worldwide similarly recall giant primordial figures embodying the whole of heaven, or indeed, the whole of creation. This phase appears to be synonymous with the protoplanetary Saturn nebula recalled in a variety of esoteric lore as the primeval state of our solar system and the abode of the gods of former times at the top of the world. Talbot has conjectured that Jupiter was originally hidden behind Saturn. It is here proposed that this was indeed true for a good portion of the Saturnian Golden Age. Because Earth appears to have been the furthest body below the conjoined orbits of the other Saturnian planets, Earth would have been a considerable distance vertically below Jupiter also. In such an arrangement, Earth and its synchronous Saturnian companions 
would pass by Jupiter roughly once with every yearly revolution around the Sun. A visually distorted Jupiter may have been occasionally visible in the north skies when Jupiter and Saturn were near conjunction. Under such conditions, Jupiter would have appeared as a bright upturned crescent, horn, or sickle backlit by the Sun. there. I'm wondering if that's what he's referring to with some of his hints. Stay with me. You find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face. Do not be troubled, for you are in Elysium, and you're already dead! <laughs> The Silver Age and the Rise of the Blue Bloods. The legacy of the Saturn Death Cult and its effect on mankind really begins with the priesthoods of the Silver Age and the rise of the nobility, the Blue Bloods. Central to the existence of the new Silver Age priesthoods was the belief that what had destroyed the Golden Age could happen again. Utilizing the new technology of writing, they set about recording the cataclysmic events as the word to serve as a memory and a warning to future generations. These warnings formed the basis of secret societies within these priesthoods. Preparations were made to ensure survival should Doomsday return. The advent of writing gave the priesthoods of the Silver Age the technology to keep alive the memories of the Cataclysm kin to the Golden Age. As people began to forget how Saturn once ruled the heavens, the increasingly misunderstood records of the priesthoods would become the basis for the beliefs of mystery schools and secret societies down through the ages. Second Age of Discovery A second great age of voyage and discovery ensued in which the refugees of the destroyed Golden Age civilizations determined to make a survey of their transformed world and cosmos and establish through their priesthoods the righteous and justice they perceived to be the legacy of that former age. Weights and measures and calendars were established and enshrined by law in a growing network of interlinked temples and monuments that span the globe. The Masonic mystery schools of the great civilization builders had arrived. Was Egypt's ancient civilization a legacy of refugees that had survived the great cataclysm and had brought the golden age to an end? Some esoteric traditions trace Egypt's past to Atlantis. Earth captures the moon. In keeping with the arrival of the Silver Age and its new sun, a new silvery marvel could now be seen in the heavens, Earth's moon. Captured by Earth and the distinctive chaos that was the Saturnian system's demise, was this white globe exhibited crescent-like phases under the sun's light that harkened back to the glory days of the Golden Age when Saturn's rings would be illuminated as crescents surrounding the former deity. It's a matter of conjecture of when Earth captured the moon, Contrary to popular belief, the moon's heavenly cratered surface is actually proof of extreme electrical strike activity due to the crater's almost uniformly perfect circular shapes. Meteorites and asteroids create angular impact craters and rarely hit celestial bodies at perfect 90 degree angles. Electrical experiments do, however, show electrical lightning produced the same kind of cratering as seen on the moon. The moon's craters can therefore not be used to date the age of the moon based on meteorite impacts, a rare event in any case throughout human history. The new moon proved an excellent keeper of time, yet its arrival would only serve to diminish the memory of the original crescents of Saturn and confuse the knowledge. Preserved in the masses of crescent-like symbols established by the priesthoods, moon cults began to distort the original intent of these symbols. Reminded of uh, that castle, the coral castle over there at Leeds Gallons. He's got crescents and Saturn in his uh, 
little abode there. I'm wondering if that's what he's referring to with some of his hints. And old knowledge gradually gave way under the weight of the new and more confused fertility rituals. Ominously, the seeds for the more sinister sex and blood rituals that would begin to spread their influences in the ages to come can be traced to the foundation of these early moon cults. The moon's almost uniformly circular craters could not have been created by multiple meteorite impacts, which would have created a majority of angular impact craters. Electrical strikes are a better explanation. Temples, priest kings, and the rise of international commerce. With the establishment of weights and measures, an excitingly new yet dangerously insidious concept began to take hold within the temples of priesthoods. The advent of the universal language of international commerce. The driving factor in the increase of trade in the Silver Age was the newly derived notion of money. At this time, money was issued in the form of clay tablet receipts against the production of goods by any given society or people. This clay tablet money was measured by and limited to the amount of goods that could be produced and stored in people's warehouse. The money was only as valuable as the amount of goods that were actually stored. This had been a central feature of the laws established by the priesthoods in ensuring equal weights and measures. However, discoveries in the mining of gold and silver quickly established a link between these metals and the idea of money. Due to the difficulty in counterfeiting these metals, it was realized that gold and silver could act as an alternative to clay tablets being used as money. This was especially useful when it came to trade between geographically separated peoples who could not verify other people's storehouses. But who would know that gold as an accepted store of value could not be faked? Unfortunately, this international element to trading quickly turned the new gold and silver money into commodities in their own right, as each society refused to accept the clay tablet receipts of other societies. Trade boomed, but at the cost of losing control over regulating the value of the fruits of your labor. That was now in the hands of the gold and silver producers. The laws established by the priesthoods as a way of ensuring just and equal weights and measures were thus cleverly subverted by the introduction of gold-backed money, which was now entirely in the hands of the gold and silver producers. As noted, under this system, the people who actually produced useful items like food and clothing lost any control they had over setting the value of their products. All they could do was price them in gold or silver, you know, the mercantiles. Corrupt elements in the temples quickly saw the advantage in controlling gold and silver as a way of dictating the value for fruits of everyday people's hard labor. With it came the transfer of immense power to highly positioned individuals within the increasingly corrupt priesthoods. As the Silver Age approached its zenith, certain priesthoods quickly consolidated their power via this new money system, until all wealth found itself being concentrated in the hands of shrinking minority. The temple became this system's center of operations, its central bank, and thus ultimately heralded the emergence of that most insidiously influential of historical characters, the priest kings. These priest kings were the original blue bloods. In reality, they were nothing more than mere merchant bankers with a monopoly over the arguably useless production of gold and silver. With the emergence of these temple-based banking parasites, the peoples of Earth began to experience a new and most sinister force, debt-based slavery. It was at about this time that some mothers started to notice that some of their children were going missing.
Origins of the Tower of Babel. The new temple-inspired commerce system proved a pervasive influence from the from the far eastern realms of the ancient Middle Kingdom and the former heights of Pan and on through the rich lands of Vendaya. Newly established priest kings steadily accumulated wealth and power, in particular certain elements of the Li clan. Li clan of ancient China were to grasp this new concept of trade financing and expand upon it to establish unimaginable influence over the hemisphere. Egypt and Samaria and the surrounding nations particularly came under the sway of this global trade system. With it, the slave trade flourished due to the need to mine more and more of the yellow metal, particularly in the mines of ancient Egypt's fishery region. Soon, gold gained idol-like attributes and its ability to sway the thoughts of men and the love of money steadily supplanted the Golden Age notion of living a just and righteous life, unfortunately. Not with all of us, though. The tragedy was that all the careful work by the early priesthoods in preserving the memory of a righteous and just golden age through a system of laws and accurate weights and measures was now being usurped by this new and easily manipulated system of commerce based on gold-backed money. The new system of commerce was the merchant banker's way of trying to build a man-made replacement for the lost heavenly ladder of the Axis Monday that had served as the original symbol for the ascent to heavenly authority. Under this new system, merchant bankers hiding behind the authority of the temple would be elevated to a position of heavenly-like authority over all commercial activity. The old established concept of authority as being founded on righteousness and justice was now replaced with the merchant bankers' debt-based slavery system. No other place exemplified this more than a place called Babel on the ancient plains of Shinar, a future location of the city of Babylon. There, the central banking temple and its merchant bankers saw their financial authority grow to towering proportions, giving rise to the legend of the Tower of Babel. Gustav Dorr's Tower of Babel is the popular conception of the Babel legend. This portrays the story as a building project that was halted when the builders' languages were scrambled. Instead, the city of Babel was like the financial center known today as the city of London, and its tower was equivalent to the Bank of England. The scrambling of the languages finds its echo in today's financial collapse, with its myriad of incomprehensible and infraudulent financial products. Your clay tablets are no good here, by the order of High Temple of Babylon, idiot. One day at the gates of Babel, oh, poor guy. So-called Tower of Babel referred to the high authority of Central Temple was which governed the financial system of the city of Babel. If you look closely at the biblical account of the Babel story, you will see that it was primarily a city that was being built on which was abandoned. Reference to a city in the Bible generally means a system or a way of doing things. Compare Jerusalem with New Jerusalem and Babylon with Mystery Babylon. Man-made economic catastrophe replaces memories of planetary upheavals. Of course, as the ensuing ages would show over and over again, a debt-based monetary system eventually implodes under its own debt-laden weight. And the higher you build its edifice, the mightier the crash. In an age fresh from multiple cosmic upheavals, the peoples of the Earth found themselves experiencing something unique, a man-made global catastrophe in the form of systemic economic meltdown. In this way did the so-called Tower of Babel collapse and the global economic chaos that followed forced whole nations and peoples to go back to their old diverse languages of commerce and trade. A confusion of different weights and measures now reigned, unsupported by any universal and unifying financial system. The priest kings were overthrown, and in their place stepped up the men of great renown the most famous being Nimrod, the mighty hunter. As is always the case, in the wake of an economic collapse, a time of tyrants follows. Nimrod, pictured left, the original tyrant, note the Venus starburst he's wearing like a modern wristwatch. Except, in this case, he knew Venus as Ishtar. Compare Ishtar symbol at right. Both images, purple dawn from the purple dawn. However, deep within the runes, of the now discredited temples of the priest kings, dark secret societies sought to preserve the concept of debt-based slavery as part of their mystery teachings. These illuminated ones 
struck a bargain with the Blue Bloods, the deposed priest kings, and embarked on the centuries of secret ritual refinement of the old alchemical creed of universal dominance through the power of creating wealth out of nothing, the power to issue debt-based money. As the age of silver drew to a close, more children were noticed to be going missing. On the horizon hovered a menacing figure, a celestial red-painted warrior Mars, and with him came the age of heroes and further upheavals. With him came war and the Bronze Age of men. The Bronze Age. Man as God. With the passing of the Silver Age, a search began for the perfect alloy of God and man. What was once the domain of mighty planets would now be the mythic and heroic exploits of the Bronze Age of man. It would be a time when conflict and war would become man's highest expression. A now comparatively calm cosmos presided over the dawn of the Bronze Age man. For the first time, mankind could look up into the heavens and see a sky not unlike what we see today. Complacency regarding the movements of the planets started setting in and man began to look within himself as a means of defining both the past and the future. The fear of doomsday shifted radically away from meticulous observation of the planets to a fear of bringing doomsday onto oneself via one's own actions. In this way did the world see the rise of demigods, powerful mythical men and women whose destinies were considered independent of the will of whatever gods had gone before. A golden age meant little in an age where men came to believe they could be a king by their own hand. The warrior king now ruled and assumed the mantle of the blue bloods whose power had been declining after the events at Babel. The age of war was the highest expression of man, now held ascendancy with art and literature, embracing the theme of the individual's will to power as the essence of a new heroic age. However, Mars and Venus were going to have at least one last word on who really did determine the rise and fall of kings and kingdoms. Rivers would run red, Locust storms would strip the land. Frogs would breed like rabbits. The firstborn children would suffer statistically improbable rates of death. Worst of all, slaves would feel free to throw off their master's yoke, and an old idea of what constituted righteousness and justice would reemerge. Though a promising beginning for this new breed of blue bloods, the Bronze Age of Man was not going to be a total picnic those warrior kings who would be their own and everybody else's masters. Mars and Venus continued to threaten the earth. The first clue as to what awaited the inhabitants of the Bronze Epoch could have been deduced from the fate of a little-known city-state that enjoyed a certain specialized agricultural monopoly, courtesy of the rise of agriculture near the end Welcome. of the preceding age. Though this would have been known at a local level for millennia, I was it wasn't just until saying, the advent of to, concentrated farming that the USA commercial potential of certain plants <laughs> could be realized. Chief amongst these was the now infamous poppy plant, a flower capable of transporting those who indulged in its juices into blissful, myopic trances, free of all lingering doomsday anxieties. In the city-state that enjoyed a monopoly in the cultivation and distribution of this highly addictive drug, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was, in its day, the Afghan opium fields, the Golden Triangle, and the British East India Company offered its numbing comfort. Well, they're in here, but their mic is 
Forget the stories of its sexual depravities and deviant proclivities. This town was an efficient drug dealing operation, second only to the CIA, which was around back then. No, it wasn't. I'm assuming he means today. Why, whatever do you mean? <laughs> and its market at the beginning of an increasingly immoral age of Browns was only getting bigger. I mean, even oh, back yeah. then they were doing it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Quite naturally, Sodom and Gomorrah's opium trade had proved remarkably recession-proof. In the aftermath of the Tower of Babel, Econom has an excellent capacity to help you do just that. Oh, its addictive properties ensured a ready supply of willing debtors to the temple-based bankers who had you know survived the fallout it's, from Babel. It's Due to its and burgeoning and wealth and influence, <laughs> as a result of the trade of opium, Sodom and Gomorrah proved a robust economic Quite a lot of work. Quite a lot of work out this week, Greg. You've put plenty out this week to look at, mate. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it all. Uh, uh, the, the, I seem to be getting a sort of um, different uh, egg, uh, versions. Yeah. So I think I'm watching. Yeah. Yeah, I, I learned. I think about I'm watching that. plenty of versions. Oh, good. I want you. I want to get your opinion on the moon. It was the first one I did tonight. Uh, it's I, it's from a book I discovered. It was written in '57. It was it's called Atlantis and the Reign of the Giants. Of course, that's an awesome title, so I had to read from it, right? And I read the first chapter. It's pretty good, you know. I mean, it's different. That's all. Well, it it is different, Greg, and uh, it's it's brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the stuff in there about Sodom and Gomorrah that I've never I've never come across before. So. Uh... It's uh, it's very interesting. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, you mean the Troy stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that quite a while ago. I was gonna play the second half of it right now. Okay, great. You, you want to check it out? Yeah, don't. Different, All right. Different. All right. I'll leave Definitely. the mics on if you want to say something. Feel free. Okay. I gotta, no, I gotta find it. I think this is it. The Purple Dawn of Mankind by Troy McLaughlin. In the beginning, there was only darkness. Yet in that darkness, there was already Raven. He was still small and weak, and his special powers had not fully developed from an Eskimo creation myth, Raven being their version of the Saturn archetype. C.M. Wood, Heroes and Hunters, from North American Indian Mythology, New York, 1982, page 17. Before the golden age of Saturn, or Kronos, as he was known to the Greeks, a time in which mankind was said to have enjoyed a tranquil and plentiful existence, bathed in the flawless light of a perfect and timeless sun, there was a primordial dawn of eternal twilight. In the earliest legend, with which the recital, i.e. the Kojiki, opens, one recognizes the primal myth, the development from a primordial darkness and chaos. This is the Kronos legend, in its thousand forms, the father of all mythologies, upon which so many peoples have constructed their cosmogony. P. Wheeler, The Sacred Scriptures of the Japanese, New York, 1952, page 387, as quoted by Dorduo Cordona, Godstar, 2006. Some mythological cycles feature a primitive age of darkness before the existence of the sun. When human beings lived in a state of anarchy without the techniques of civilized life. H. Osborne, South American Mythology, Mythology of the Americas, London, 1970, page 294, is quoted with emphasis by Dordu Cordona, Godstar, 2006, page 278. Note in the second of the two above quotes the reference to an age of darkness before the existence of the sun. According to E. A. S. Butterworth, the sun of the ancients is not the natural sun of heaven, for it neither rises nor sets but is, as it seems, ever in the zenith above the navel of the world. There are signs of an ambiguity between the pole star and the sun. Yet those words belie what mythology is inferring when it speaks of an age of darkness. We should not construe this age to be one that was black as night, but rather that the available light was subdued and hued with a distinctive color that would come to be associated with Saturn. Take a wage tell Ponte Cutley, an alter ego for Quetzalcoatl, Aztec Saturn, 
who is credited as being the first light at creation, is the god of the dawn light that was created before the sun. The Roman poet Martinius Capella provides a clue as to what color this light was when he has the goddess Harmonia declaring that the rays from the god Jupiter renew the purple dawn for men. An obvious reference to a previous age before Jupiter's ascent in place of Saturn. The Hopi tribe of North America have songs that talk of a dark purple light of creation coming from the north, while the Chinese still refer to the celestial northern pole region as the Purple Pole. In all cases, and many others, the color purple is linked to Saturn, especially during a primordial time remembered in mythology as the dawn of creation. What this tells us is that there once was a distantly ancient age wrapped in a sea of dark celestial purple, a purplish light that radiated a dense and global warmth that seems to have emanated from a single dull orb shining at a time well before the arrival of the sun. We see today this glowing disk appears to have been permanently stationed at the far north of the heavens, as the late researcher Gordieu Cardona surmised. The evidence of myth, which points to Saturn having once occupied a position above Earth's north polar regions, is voluminous. There is not a race on Earth it has not preserved at least one account which states as much. According to this evidence, Saturn occupied a central position in the north celestial regions. It rotated and rotated widely, but other than that, it was immovable. Cordona 78. It is this darkened and primordial sun, this dull and immovable orb, that would eventually become the god and planet known as Saturn. But before Saturn rose to his status as the great creator god of mythology, Primordial man spoke of this time as the great dream time of our distant past, a time celebrated in the oral and written traditions, ancient peoples, the world over. Like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly, it was not the same sun which we see, it is said in their old tales, the Papal Vu, Mesoamerican creation story. According to this understanding, at that time, there was no bright yellow sun as we know it today, one that rises in the east and sets in the west. There was no way to calculate the passage of time, to tell day from night. No stars could be seen through the dense atmospheric purple haze that engulfed the heaven. There was no moon from which to tell the passing of time by its phases, or by which the Earth's ocean could be influenced by great tidal forces. Humanity lived in a perpetual state of dusky darkness. Everything wrapped within a warm and bountiful purple hue that permeated all existence and in which the nocturnal thrived. Like a giant blind reddish purple eye looking onto the world from within a swirling heavenly purple chaos, primordial man would have seen Saturn as a single pale disk of light radiating its benign presence from a position locked at Earth's celestial north. It had always been there a presence that was an integral yet silently ethereal part of the Earth's landscape and mankind's experience. For how long this state of affairs had lasted, it is impossible to tell. How life on Earth may have looked during the age known as the Purple Dawn, when Earth was in orbit around primordial Saturn circa 100,000 BC. Saturn can be seen in its primeval state as magenta-hued sub-brown dwarf star. Saturn's famous rings had not yet formed at this time, the murky existence of life on Earth, as suggested, the earliest mythological narratives and portrayed in the previous would have belied the even and global warmth that allowed humans to walk unclothed and troubled by weather extremes. While a semi-nocturnal world seems at odds with modern concepts of what would be a healthy planetary environment, the supposed need for bright sunlight and a rotating calendar of seasons to support life is overstated. All that would be required for the sustaining of a habitable planet is precisely what the myth suggests primordial man enjoyed. An adequate amount of evenly radiated heat energy with a minimum red-blue light spectrum required for photosynthesis in predominantly philocybin based plants. Much in the same way, I swear, much in the same way that we observe coastal areas supporting submerged red algae under the filtering effects of the oceans. So too would the Earth's primordial environment under Saturn have enjoyed a radiating filtered heat in which red-hued vegetation would have flourished. 
A collection of pioneering alternative theorists have, in recent decades, sought to identify this dull primordial sun of mythology as having been a brown dwarf star, a fairly common celestial object that would have radiated energy in the red-blue, purple spectrum, rather than the red-green bright light of the sun we see today. Accordingly, when factoring ancient descriptions of the god Saturn in his primordial state, we can determine that if Saturn was indeed a brown dwarf star, then Saturn would have typically produced its own far-reaching heliosphere, or what Electric Universe proponents call a plasma sheath, a type of electrical bubble which would have extended out into space like a giant egg-like cocoon. The startling supposition is that an electric cocoon of this type would have embraced the Earth and all its inhabitants. The inside of this hypothesized plasma bubble would have acted like a dull mirror, a reflective field that would have uniformly bounced the star's warm radiation back onto all parts of the planet's surface to produce the even purplish primordial glow related to us by these ancient traditions. That's probably where we get light shows from. This reflected light and energy would have produced warm regions at both poles, while almost entirely negating meteorological effects like wind and rain. Wind and rain, weather features so common today under the current sun. To the ancients of the gold, silver, and bronze ages, this dull moon-like disk from the time of the purple dawn came to be identified as the sleeping form of the god Kronos, Greek, or Saturn, Latin. In other cultures, it would come to be known as Ra, Egyptian, oh, okay. Enlo, Mesopotamia, Tlaloc, Aztec, later transformation into Quetzalcoatl, and Shangdi, China. Though modern mythologists would later confuse many of these deities as being representations of our current yellow sun, an alternative interpretation of comparative mythology suggests they all share common identity traits with the Roman god Saturn, who was in turn identified directly with the planet Saturn. And that's the problem, is these interpretations later changed a lot of these gods. I've noticed that. About chemical traditions, have it that this planet Saturn was our original and best sun, the first sun, before the coming of the red-yellow star we call today the sun. Today, this very same pale disk, spoken of in the earliest creation epics of mythology and seen inhabiting Earth's celestial north, can be positively identified as being the actual planet Saturn, at a time when it was in its primordial state as a brown dwarf star. Yet today, the same planet which was said to have once ruled the heavens from up high in the north is now a distant spot of light seen at the outer reaches of our current solar system. But it is the eventful and often frightening journey that the primordial Saturn would take on its path to the outer reaches of the solar system that has become the historic basis for much of the world's mythology and mankind's memory of a once great golden age. It is the forgotten journey that Saturn took from being Earth's primordial sun to its current position as a distant ring gas giant that will help explain the influence of the god Saturn over the warped occult phenomenon central to this work, the Saturn Death Cult. Locating Earth's original geomagnetic North Pole. It is important to note that Earth's geomagnetic pole would have been in a completely different position at this time to where it is today, hat tip to Ted Holden. With Earth's current geographic North Pole region having been originally pointed at its original brown dwarf sun, the planet's geomagnetic field would have necessarily still been orientated in line with its celestial north despite its phase-locked equatorial relationship with Saturn. However, this would have positioned a phase-locked Earth geomagnetic north pole in a very different position. The best contender for where primordial Earth's geomagnetic north could once have been is strongly suggested by two significant bulges in the Earth's crust. These two bulges happen to be on opposite sides of Earth to each other. The larger one is called the Pacific Bulge and it is located on the North Pacific's ocean floor between Hawaii and Asia. The smaller bulge is located on the opposite side of the planet in the South Atlantic. If Earth's current northern polar region was once always once pointed at Saturn as it orbited in phase lock, 
Then Earth's geomagnetic north might likely have been located where the Pacific bulge is today. Being the bigger of the two opposing bulges, the Pacific bulge is the best candidate for Earth's original point of geomagnetic north. The bulge having been a possible consequence of Earth's original and differently orientated geomagnetic gravitational forces. The same would have been true to a lesser degree in the creation of opposing Atlantic African bulge. Currently, Earth also has significant bulges in the Arctic and Antarctic regions where the current geomagnetic north and south poles are found. In the age of the dinosaurs, Earth's distant primordial phase-locked relationship with Saturn was most likely the environment experienced by the dinosaurs while they still walked the Earth. Most animals are nocturnal by nature. The permanent gloom of this time would have suited any nocturnal species, including dinosaurs. The heavy ultraviolet light shed by Saturn was the same beneficial ultraviolet light used today by reptilian pet owners to provide their pets with a basking spot in their enclosures. Reptiles in particular find this kind of ultraviolet light to their liking, as do most species of insects that see best in ultraviolet spectrum. Saturn's infrared spectrum would have also served most mammals well, the vast majority of which are nocturnal. While mammals internally produce their own vitamin C, pigs and humans are the salient exception. Under these postulated Saturnian light conditions, pigs and humans would have needed to eat sources of vitamin C in order to stay healthy. Previous image, Earth during the age of the dinosaurs. The primordial brown dwarf star Saturn sat stationary as Earth orbited Saturn in a phase lock. The future Arctic region was always pointed at Saturn. Geomagnetic North Pole was most likely situated where the present Pacific bulge is located. A permanent purple twilight saturated the Earth, with Saturn's plasma bubble appearing like a vast heavenly chaotic ocean. The even purple-hued light shed by Saturn and its plasma bubble cast no shadows and the air was gently still. No rain clouds formed on the Earth, but Saturn's water misted down onto Earth's surface in a dense, humid vapor. Saturn's ultraviolet light spectrum would have been highly beneficial for nocturnal reptilian species. Great. Reptilian species, huh? So now we find out that the Purple Dawn was most conducive for reptiles. I wonder if there's anything to that the David Icke stuff. I wouldn't be surprised. Have you heard of the Emerald Tablets by Thoth? It just so happens a reptile is green. Apparently they were found in a Mayan temple in Mexico. He says in it that one day they will attack those who reside beneath us. How about that? The megafauna giants of the past. Earth's electrical relationship to its primordial brown dwarf star Saturn would have produced a variable and lesser gravity. According to the Electric Universe principles, this would have allowed for the development of gigantic proportions in many species, most now extinct due to Earth's heavier gravity. When the gigantic fossilized remains of dinosaurs were first discovered, it was assumed that creatures this large would have had to, to buoy their massive weights by spending their lives in marshes and swamps. But subsequent discoveries have conclusively proven that these monsters spent their lives on dry land. They became the impossible dinosaurs because nobody could work out how their physical structures would have supported their own bulk under current gravitational conditions. Much has been postulated in attempts to explain this challenge to the accepted modern day physics model that calls for Earth's gravity to have been a constant throughout its existence. These explanations have been inconclusive in the opinion of this writer, mostly because they are usually an effort to fit the evidence of the fossil record with the gravitational environment we observe today. But the more obvious solution is that the dinosaurs and even some more of the recent mammalian giants must have thrived during a time when Earth's gravity was much weaker. Earth must have enjoyed a nocturnal purple light glow and a lower level of gravity during its pre-human past. 
and this would have facilitated not only the development of larger animals and insects, but also much larger plants and trees. A thick, oxygen-rich atmosphere during its earliest existence would have complemented a lower gravity to allow for the flight of huge pteranodons and the giant insects that we know existed in the very distant past. The successful flight of such creatures with present gravity is doubtful, actually impossible. golden age. A time of bliss and plenty, the fabled golden age of mankind existed for the duration of Saturn's precarious life as Earth's polar sun, a position threatened by the unstable nature of the newly born planet Venus and the encroachment of the sun and its own planetary satellites. While initial contact between the plasma sheaths of both the Saturnian system and the Sun had been catastrophic for life on Earth. It also brought about the impetus for the rise of civilization and the golden age of exploration. Time and measure could now be put to use in surveying a world which would give its bounty freely due to the continued radiating warmth of the flared Saturn. But that was not the end of the cataclysmic events stalking the Earth. What was known as the Golden Age would in fact be permeated with catastrophic episodes that would eventually lead up to one of the greatest cataclysmic events in human experience, the Great Deluge, under a new sun. In the time after Saturn experienced its first contact with the electrical influence of the sun, the new look Saturnian system spiraled away back into interstellar space. As noted before, the sun now could be seen from Earth as a distant light rising in the east and setting in the west. Intense auroral activity created various permeations in a pillar-like Brooklyn current that connected Earth to the northern heavenly abode of Saturn. You know, and I'm wondering if this is why we like light shows at rock concerts. Rock art, or petroglyphs, have captured these permeations in abundance and provide a useful view of the celestial sights witnessed by man during this golden age. It's a nice picture. The pinch effect on plasmas can lead to a shape that would have looked like a squatting man with arms held aloft in support of the heavens. See pictures below for image of plasma in a laboratory environment. Characteristic rendition of this auroral effect has been etched into rock faces the world over. Indeed, looks good. Hmm. Yeah. Top left recreation of the basic squatter man pinch effect captured in plasma laboratory experiment. Top right, American petroglyphs with distinctive squatting man images. Middle right, Spanish squatter man. Bottom right, American star burst pattern. Bottom left, American squatter man under concentric circles. The emergence of totems in various cultures also reflects a heritage going back to the golden age when Saturn's rings appeared as outstretched wing-like crescents atop a glowing ladder. Hmm, I see. The speculative impression of the classic totem pole legacy as represented of the Earth's Brooklyn current. When I was a kid, I just loved totem poles. I figured I was just attracted to them. The twisting, spiraling nature of Brooklyn filaments reaching out into space would sometimes terminate in a fork-like effect. This is clearly represented in various rock art petroglyphs as depicted in the above right insert. However, Saturn's spiral journey through space 
meant that a return to the point of contact with the sun's heliosphere was inevitable for Saturn and its southerly string of planets. How many times this process repeated itself is unclear, but sufficient to say that each time an approach was made, catastrophic events, deluge, global firestorms, and massive Earth changes could be expected to unfold in both the heavens and on Earth. The Golden Age Polar Configuration of the Saturn System Though the ancients would not have perceived this as such, the Saturnian polar configuration now consisted of four planets from Earth's perspective. First in line from the northern top of the configuration was, of course, Saturn, itself now surrounded by frozen water rings and orbited by nine small followers. It still glowed brilliantly after its energizing contact with the Sun's heliosphere. Next in line was the feminine Venus, the evening star, the bride of Saturn, a planet that would display wonderful streamers of light when electrically excited that were seen as four and eight pointed starbursts radiating out from Saturn's center. Whether Venus was ejected by Saturn during the first flare-up or had always been there is not fully understood, but the chaos monster that had heralded her appearance was a direct result of Venus coming to life. After Venus came masculine Mars, red in color, and seemingly enveloped in the womb of Venus. Mars was the morning star, son of Saturn, and viewed as the archetype rebellious hero, unseen during the purple dawn. The massive electrical discharge between Saturn and Mars had obliterated Mars' atmosphere, turning this planet's surface red. These three, Saturn, Venus, and Mars, formed the heavenly abode, an abode that could only be reached via the heavenly ladder that was the giant plasma Birkeland current that rose from Earth's North Pole, the Axis Monday of legend. Earth, the last in this string of planets, was now the humble abode of mere mortals. Interplanetary Warfare it was during these times that the ancients witnessed the beginnings of discord between these godlike planets and began to fear destructive visitations by these celestial bodies. The planet Mars, the dark pupil in the all-seeing eye that was Saturn, made close approaches to Earth along the length of the visible yet translucent plasma current joining the string of planets. Looming large, it would bombard the Earth with its Martian rocks and thunderbolts before reascending up to its position under Venus, which would itself flare and stream light in awesome displays of cosmic lightning and beauty. Yet Wal Thornhill said that the polar configuration could only work if Mars oscillated between Saturn and the Earth. At least one full-on thunderbolt-laden battle was waged between Venus and Mars, during which Mars suffered a great scarring injury that we now see today on its surface as the huge chasm called Phallus Marineris. The warrior god, the scarred face, had earned his battle honors. Yes, that might have been what it looked like. And that was the story of the Iliad, too, if I'm not mistaken. The giant scar of Phallus Marineris on the face of Mars the result of extreme interplanetary electrical arcing between a newborn Venus and Mars seen from Earth. These terrifying celestial battles have been etched onto the collective memories of mankind in their depictions of Mars as the scarred warrior hero and god of war. Such episodes were looked on with abject terror by Earth's inhabitants and probably accounted for various extinction events in the Earth's history. Due to the destructive effects of these planetary, planetary fluctuations and en close encounters. Also, and largely due to the day night effect of the encroaching sun's equator equatorially orientated light source, life on Earth under the Saturnian sun began to look different. Gone was the luxuriant reddish and purple hue of the planet's fauna, and the atmosphere now replaced by the more familiar green cast of Earth's forest and jungles, thanks to the different radiation frequencies caused by the flare-up. Deserts began to appear and the oceans started to rise. More and more distant stars could be seen at night and the various constellations began to take shape. Saturn and the Axis Monday, at the height of the Golden Age, midday. Auroral activity at the base of the Axis Monday would have created the illusion of a mountain from which the ladder to heaven ascended. 
This would be known as the Mountain of the Gods to most cultures and most famously as Mount Olympus to the Greeks. The slide towards catastrophe. Gravity during the Golden Age started to get heavier. Now the two suns shed their energies over the Earth, with the planet possible increasing in actual size. Due to its increased energy, absorption being converted into mass. A equals mc squared. Massive fissures and cracks would have appeared on Earth as a result with correspondingly dramatic increases in volcanic and earthquake activity. Eventually, Saturn and its family of planets were permanently captured by the Sun, with the result that the Sun began to make a closer yet stable and more regular passage across the sky from east to west. The Saturnian system's polar configuration continued to persist with Saturn becoming ever dimmer during the day and starting to take on a sick, blotchy look at night. The legendary letter to heaven that was the Birkeland current connection between Earth and Saturn started to buckle and itself oscillate, giving the appearance of a decrepit figure now ruling in the northern sky. Already weakened by the various episodes involving the oscillations of Mars and Venus, along its length. It was now only a matter of time before the interplanetary plasma current snapped altogether and Earth would be severed forever from the Saturnian heavenly abode. The catalyst came in the form of the Great Deluge. Doomsday had arrived. walk into this room at your own risk because it leads to the future this is not a new world it is simply an extension of what began in the old one it has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time it has refinements technological advances and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom but like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. A case to be filed under M for mankind in the Twilight Zone. Doomsday. A great cataclysm called the Deluge, is said to have ended the bliss of the Golden Age. Saturn lost its position at Earth's celestial north, and Venus and Mars went on a cosmological rampage. During Saturn's initial flare-up, due to its first contact with the Sun's heliosphere, part of the ensuing chaos that enveloped Saturn had seen two filaments of discharged material escape into space, only to be captured by the Sun there for an unspecified time. They orbited their new star until such a time as when Saturn itself eventually became captured by the Sun. These filaments were primarily composed of Saturn's discharged particles of water, the remainder having been retained by Saturn to form that planet's distinctive ring. And what caused the end of the Golden Age? One of these frozen watery filaments collided with the Earth. As the Saturnian ring of planets was being captured by the Sun, this precipitated a deluge of water from space. It lasted for weeks. These filaments were primarily composed of Saturn's discharged particles of water. Atlantis sank beneath the weight. The great continent of Mu perished. Earthquakes of unimaginable magnitude raked the Earth, while giant winds scoured its surface. The Axis Mundi, Earth's fabled ladder to heaven, was irreparably damaged by this collision, and a decidedly sick, blotchy, and dimming Saturn was clearly starting to drift apart from its former system of planets. Severed from their electrical chain-like links to their original sun, the planets Venus and Mars ran amok. Those on Earth 
watched horrified as Venus took on comet-like aspects, turning into a Medusa and threatening the Earth with massive interplanetary lightning displays as it swooped by on its way to finding its new orbit. The breakup of the Saturnian system, Venus, was transformed from a beautiful evening star to evil Medusa with flowing serpent-like hair, an archetype of the rampaging planet Venus celebrated in art down through the centuries. Earth is overwhelmed by the effects of Venus, erratic behavior, while Mars battles the violent Medusa-like Venus. The collage by Troy incorporating the works of Duval, Bachland, Martin, and Caravaggio. I wonder if those skulls of Peru are reptilians. Planetary Chaos. Mars was no better and constantly threatened to erratically swing by Earth at close quarters while hurling stones and thunderbolts before it. Some of these Martian meteorites have been found as far afield as Antarctica. The subsequent series of battles in this free-for-all phase between Venus and Mars loomed large in the heaven and provided the inspiration for much of mythology's greatest stories. As if this were not enough, the slowly retreating Saturn, or at least its position in the sky over Earth, was now being stalked by another player in the grand cosmic drama, Jupiter. As Earth suffered under the onslaught of the deluge from heaven and the axis mundi all but disappeared, Saturn began a descent below the horizon. At this time, another bright star was seen to emerge in what had to have been Earth's southern skies. It too was seen to have rings, and due to the increased electrical activity in the region, also sported its own Brooklyn current, which sent electrical arcing displays out into space around it, and gave the illusion to observers on Earth as if this new star were dangling by a rope. Called Zeus by the Greeks and Jupiter by the Romans, this previously hidden star seemed to briefly supplant the role of dying Saturn as the dominant force in the heaven. And uh, this, or Zeus, was one of the sun's planets. As it orbited into electrical contact with the Saturn system, it could be seen in Earth's southern skies, seemingly dangling on the end of its own Brooklyn current. Faint rings could be detected around Jupiter, giving it the reputation of having stolen Saturn's rings. In mythology, Jupiter was the son of Saturn, who ended up murdering his father and replacing him. Mm, nice. I don't know where I come from, we love our fathers. Jupiter is said to have tried stealing the rings of Saturn, an obvious reference to Jupiter's mythological murder of his cosmic father. And they said the same thing of Saturn with Uranus, too. The Jupiter was a part of the Sun's original solar system and acted as a partner in a binary star system. It is one possible contention. However, they share a common berry center, so I would think that Jupiter would be offspring of the Sun, or born in the same group with it. Their oxygen matches to this system may have been as much disrupted by the arrival of Saturn as Saturn's system was devastated by contacts on the big boy, with Jupiter then positioned in orbit around the Sun as it is today. Though on a different radius, it can be speculated that it eventually joined the fray by gradually swinging in through Earth's southern skies while on its regular orbit and eventually appearing to come in from behind and below Saturn as seen from Earth. Another theory says that Jupiter and the other gas giants of Neptune and Uranus were always a part of the Saturnian system, but hidden from Earth on the other side of Saturn. Either way, mythology indicates that Jupiter sees Saturn's place and status in the heavens for a time, though Saturn eventually did make a sickly comeback as the reigning Lord of the Rings, as Earth righted itself after the axis rocking events of the Great Deluge. However, the old god was dying, seemingly struck with leprosy, a result of increased atmospheric activity on the gaseous former star and now saw permanent exile at the outer edges of the Sun-Solar System, where it remains to this day. A distant pinprick of light, somehow at odds with its reputation as one of mythology's greatest gods. Saturn now drifting off into the outer distance, along with its seven rings and nine followers, a cataclysmically shocked Earth now found itself firmly in the grip of its new star, the Sun. 
The erratic and dangerous orbits of Mars and Venus continued to threaten the Earth, though, as they sought orbital and electrical balance with this, of this new sun. Whole new societies dedicated to tracking these violent entities rose up amongst the Earth's inhabitants as the survivors and refugees from the Great Deluge fought to rebuild their shattered home world. The priesthoods were born, and with them, the world entered into the Silver Age. Oftentimes I wonder to myself, why does our society seem so upside down? Why is there such a conflict in every area of science? Why does this schism exist not just in one place, but in all places? Why is the electric universe being ignored? Why is our history in such conflict? That's what's so hard to figure out who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. I found this interesting read here about uh, Saturn. I'm going to read it to you. All right, Sheriff in the ancient Egypt was a lawgiver, and his badge was always a six-pointed star, which is a symbol of Saturn. U.S. sheriffs in the Wild West up to today still wear the six-pointed star. It is interesting that Saturn's symbol is the six-pointed star. Well, now we know that it was also a five-pointed and an eight-pointed star, so that was just one of its phases. Okay, 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 star. Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. Saturn day is the sixth day of the week. Not really. Saturday is actually the seventh day of the week. Sunday being the first. People always seem to forget that. Now NASA is receiving images of the Saturn hexagon, a six-sided atmospheric formation at Saturn's poles. The sixth chakra of the human energy system is the third eye, pineal gland. Six, three times is 666. When your third eye chakra opens, you develop your sixth sense of intuition. Well, that's a good one. And spirituality. From a consciousness perspective, the sixth sense, your intuitions, hunches, are messengers of God, your guardian angels. Isn't it interesting that angels have halos, rings, around their heads? And Saturn is the only planet with a halo or ring around it. Okay. Um, that is why today, when you get married, you get married before God. And the symbol of that God is the ring that is put on each other's fingers. Oh, don't get me started with that. The ring of Saturn. You're wearing God's ring. And the Yarmulke was the round ring that you wear on your head for Saturn, your God. Even in the Middle Ages, in the temples, Catholic monks would shave their heads in a round circle. And Hebrews, instead of doing that, would wear the Yarmulke. But it all had to do with the round rings of Saturn. Jordan Maxwell matrix of power. The ancient name of Saturn was, as mentioned, El. It is the reason why those that were chosen by El were called elites. Oh, elites. Okay. In fact, the words elect, elder, elevated, Elohim, temple, circle, gospel, apostle, disciple, evangelist, etc. all derive from the cult of El. Angels are messengers of God. Angel or Angel. Angel, too, for like a builder. But God was L, which is why we have the name of the archangels bearing the L suffix. Raphael, Michael, Uriel, Gabriel, Michael Sarion. Astrotheology and Sidereal Mythology. The plural term Elohim appears over 2,500 times in the Old Testament but it is falsely translated in most versions. This fact of plurality explains why, in Genesis, gods said, let us make man in our image. And I always wondered about that. As staged, oh, plural, as stated, 
Elohim refers to both gods and goddesses, and its singular form, El, served as a prefix or suffix to the name gods, people, and places, whence Emmanuel, Gabriel, Bethel, even except Satan, was one of the Elohim. Hmm. Oh, 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 oh. But I heard that Satan, I don't know if this is true, but I heard this, in the ancient times before Catholicism, he made him into something bad. His name was actually Satan, the tester. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it puts a little bit of a different light on it, doesn't it? The gods of the Elohim, angels, the messengers of God, when witches cast a spell, they put the hex on someone. It is the elites who run the world today, and it's religion. In Islamic tradition, the rock is where Muhammad ascended to heaven, accompanied by the angel Gabriel. Atlantean, too, is the El The dome of the rock was built in the 600 AD era and was won back by the Israelites on 6767 after the Six Day War. <laughs> the dome's outer walls measure 60, 6 times 10 feet, and 36, 6 times 6 feet. The Knights Templar claimed the Dome of the Rock was the site of the Temple of Solomon. Now, I've heard Solomon means soul of man, salt of man, a couple of different things. I got that from um, Mr. Astrotheology, Benici, um, and set up their Templum Domini adjacent to it during the 12th century. 12th century. 12th Saturn is an important key to understanding the long heritage this conspiracy has back to antiquity. The city of Rome was originally known as Saturnia, or the city of Saturn. That is true. The Roman Catholic Church retains much of the Saturn worship in its ritual. Saturn also relates to Lucifer. That's to have that observatory that they named the Lucifer Observatory. I always wondered that. In various occult dictionaries, Saturn is associated with evil. Saturn was important to the religion of Mithra and also to the Druids, Fritz, Springmeier, bloodlines of the Illuminati. Rome was known to the Romans as Saturnia, not Rome, and Saturn was one of their gods. Black is both Saturn's color and Satan's color. I thought it was red. And uh, is he in a red suit? <laughs> the Black Holy Bible, Bible, tells us Satan is 666. Satan is the sixth planet, its symbol, the six-pointed star. It supposedly has a hexagon weather formation. Saturday is actually the seventh day, like I said. And they also used a five-point and an eight-point star. So that's not entirely right. Is this all divine coincidence? Or is our perception of Saturn and the other planets being manipulated by the Masonic magicians at NASA? And uh, there's an answer that was really good to it. I conversed with Saturn on many occasions. Okay, request the Bible rewritten. Well, yeah, who knows? Uh, I don't know. It's crazy. But I'm going to give you a, a response that was pretty good to all that. Um, the word police... It's different. Pole ice. P-O-L-E-I-C-E. -E. Huh. How about that? Pole ice. Okay. Awesome. Um, interesting that humans are carbon-based life forms. And since the carbon atom has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, our number is 666. Okay. Now this other person comes in named Zaro41 and really kind of sets it straight. My dear... You do not know anything of Saturn. You talk about things. The equation Saturn equals Satan was created by the Catholic Church to destroy the cult of Saturn, which was very strong in Italy and throughout the Roman Empire. Saturnus means divine intellect. Nus, the sacred fire, er, of the state of being. Sat, sat, to yuga, was the golden age, and Saturnus was the god of being and time. Saturnus was the god of the Golden Age. The Latins, spoken of the Saturna Regna, the reigns of Saturn, 
which were characterized precisely by the god as a symbol of royalty and wisdom. The treasure of Rome was under the temple of Saturn. The Catholic Church has converted Saturnalia into Christmas. Even in the 7th and 8th centuries, people honored the god of gold and being. The destruction of the cult of the god Saturnus was based on the equivalence of Saturn's equals Satan 666. Things are different from what history writes. The story is written by the winners, not the losers. I could write a book about the god Saturn. And, well, that kind of changed it a little bit. I, uh, I, I you know, I'm totally on to that. And um, then, then someone comes in and says this. The planet Saturn used to be extremely close to the Earth. Whether or not the Earth-Saturn system was as close to the Sun as present-day Earth is unknown. Viewing our solar system's past from the way it looks in the present is chasing a dead end. It didn't always look this way. Saturn used to look much different and had no rings. It was in all likelihood a brown dwarf. Amen. The Earth star, as the Far East still refers to it as Sol, Saturn, was a binary star system. Sol had planets of its own, and Earth was one of was not an Earth. No, oh, the Sun had planets of its own, and Earth was not one of them. Earth belonged to Saturn. Saturn appeared as an eye in the sky, the origin of the all-seeing eye. What happened? It got too close to the Sun. Tidal forces literally destroyed the planet. Venus was likely created from a Saturn ejection, as was the ice that make up its rings. It is possible that Saturn split into Jupiter and Saturn, or quite possibly one or both of the other gas giants. Yeah, that, that might be very possible, like Neptune. It's also possible that Jupiter's always orbited the Sun. Yes, indeed. They have the uh, same, pretty much the same actual tilt, and they share a few other things as well, like oxygen. Nerd ice. Or uh, Jupiter and the Sun were the ancient solar system. Either way, the orbit of the Earth was changed. Tidal forces and debris set off volcanoes wreaked havoc on the planet. Saturn, when visible, would have looked like a fiery winged disk during this destructive process. The raining ice particles would have flooded the planet. The influence of the Sun would have had a dramatic effect on all life. Eventually, things stabilized as they are today with Saturn, our father, far from us. Mars, another Saturnian planet that had life, was placed in an orbit where life was unsustainable. How this would have looked to the intelligent creatures of Earth is likely the origin of many mythologies and religions. Well said. By the way, if Saturn was a brown dwarf, the sun's light might, depending on their orbit, shine down on an angle giving the impression of an arc. This is why, in Egyptian mythology, the sun rests on an arc or bull horns. Pretty good, pretty good. And this person's name was anonymous. <laughs> Should have left your name. That was an excellent answer. Um, that is on the AtlanteanConspiracy.com. I don't know much about it. I just, I just happened to catch that. And let's not forget the human chakra system, which resembles Saturn and its rings. The interesting where they they smoke hashashin were luscious grounds, beautiful, luxurious places with lots of grass and flowers and fruits, and virgins. So this business about the virgin and the reward was done there by Hassan ibn Sabah. Ah, that's where they get their that's idea of heaven the idea. from. Right. Huh. That, that's where that came from. Interesting. You know. But this is all in Spencer's Encyclopedia of the Occult. He himself, Spence, the author, was a Rosicrucian. That's, a, that, that's another Sufi group. I don't want to go into the Rose Cross. So that's where that came from. So you're saying that there are all these different organizations. Uh, one is the Sabbatian cult, which are Jews that were kicked out of Judaism. There's the Illuminati, which were not Jews. They were uh, Gentiles who had their own little secret uh, thing. You've got today Skull and Bones Society that we heard about with Yale University and President Bush and uh, many popular, I should say popular, but many famous politicians well, today. Professor Anthony Sutton wrote about that in depth, too. He was the one that I just quoted earlier as being the author of uh, the Wall Street and the Bush Re Revolution and Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. So Anthony Sutton has, has written about that. He has a set, separate book out on that. Now I can tell you that in my, in my two volumes, I start showing straight lines 
from the Illuminati and the Frankist, the Haskalah movement, the Jacobin Society, the Reform Movement, and different years that initiatives had. The Illuminati were involved to destroy the Bible and biblical authority and to help promote <coughs> biblical criticism in the university. Policies and agendas and who's running things. So, Rabbi Antiman, what you're saying is, is that a lot of this started with a cult of people who thought that Shabtai Tzvi, who lived in the uh, 16th century or the 17th, 17th, 17th century. century, 1626, 1676. <clears throat> okay, he claimed that he was the um, Messiah. Uh, in the end, he got so many followers that he was a threat to the kingdom. So the Sultan said, either convert or die. He was jailed. He was put in prison. He chose got into the whole death cult aspect of it which will be the next episode. So, until then, please like, share, or comment. The more attention or the more love you give this video, the more eyes it will reach. Take care, and I'll see you on down the road. Using the standard model of stars. So the solution? Completely ad hoc. The object must have twice the surface area, it must be twins. Now the electric universe says, <laughs> I mean, that is just an amazing uh, uh, ad hoc solution. The spectra of red dwarfs are crowded with molecular absorption features that are not well understood. So it's hard to extract the physical properties of a given red dwarf from its spectrum. That is also interesting. But the fact that there are so many molecular absorption features indicates that all of the requirements for life exist within that glowing envelope. So, all stars are electric. All stars, all red stars are gigantic. Planets can orbit within their anode glow, and even astronomers acknowledge that. They have suggested that there could be satellites uh, orbiting within the Betelgeuse glow. However, with their notion that the red giant is formed by an ultra-hot core, those planets would not be suitable for life. In the electric universe, it has a cool core. Objects orbiting within the red envelope are suitable for life. Now, one of the very interesting things is that there are no seasons on any satellites orbiting within that red sphere because the energy received on any body within that sphere is equal over the entire surface of that body. So that a planet orbiting within that red sphere has no seasons, even temperatures. In fact, I would say the brown dwarfs are the cosmic wombs of life in the universe. One of the interesting facts, of course, that would uh, suddenly come out of this is that these red spheres are glowing plasma and glowing plasma will not let radio waves pass through. So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence using radio waves is in my opinion a wasted effort because anyone living on a satellite inside one of these glowing red wombs would not even be aware that there was a greater universe out there full of stars let alone try and use radio because any radio signals would not pierce that, um, that plasma. Just an interesting side issue here. So this is my view of proto-Saturn, and I've just put two satellites there, but there are obviously more. Titan, for instance, would have been one of the satellites. Earth and Mars. So there they are inside this glowing shell, and the evidence uh, of the earliest recollections of mankind appears to be that the purple dawn of creation uh, was the, the skylight. That was the colour of the sky, purple dawn. And that is precisely the colour you would expect in this circumstance because you have the red end of the spectrum and you also have a certain amount of the violet and ultraviolet light due to electrical activity in the plasma. So this fits with the, if you like, the earliest recollections of mankind that that was our environment. 50% of red dwarfs have Earth-sized planets in their habitable zone. Remember I said that astronomers feel this is the place where life is most likely to be found. Now, if you look at uh, Jupiter, for instance, and consider that as a, a red dwarf and its plasma sphere was lit up, 
Io has a 1.75 day orbit, Europa has a 3.5 day orbit, Ganymede 7 days and Callisto 17 days. Any of the satellites that were released from Jupiter's grip would have a rotation rate which equaled their daily rotation rate because they're locked always with the same face towards the, um, the central body. It suggests that the Earth and Mars had orbits which uh, were about a day in length. This is the kind of information that you can get from this kind of model. The other thing is, you'll notice in this uh, diagram, there is no Venus. So, we have a huge red anode glow, which was what we call proto-Saturn. We had a purple dawn of creation and no Venus. These are the important things to understand about proto-Saturn. Just recently, um, a map of a red, nearby red dwarf was produced using a Doppler imaging technique. It's one of a pair of red dwarfs near Alpha Centauri with a separation of three astronomical units. There's a bright near polar region which can be clearly seen in the upper right panels and a darker mid-latitude area visible in the lower left panels is consistent with large-scale cloud inhomogeneities. However, that's an assumption that what we're looking at is an atmosphere, but we're not looking at an atmosphere, we're looking at a plasma sheath. So the, this variation said in the electric universe model will be due to objects orbiting within that plasma sheath, either inside or outside that plasma sheath, because that would affect the discharge. The other thing is that um, this bright spot towards the pole is the same kind of thing that's found with, at Betelgeuse, the red giant, which indicates that that's the electrical connection with the Birkeland currents that drive these particular stars. If I'm right, the patterns here should be more repetitive than weather patterns and without banding like Jupiter, which is undetectable so far by this technique, but you never know what they can do tomorrow. Red dwarfs and giants change in radius, which is not the kind of thing that you would expect if this is um, uh, a normal body. However, this change in radius is the star's response to changes in its electrical environment. It's quite natural. It's a plasma effect. They also tend to flicker in brightness. All of this is indicative of a star lacking the stabilising effect of the bright photosphere of bright stars. That's according to Don Scott's transistor model, that is a stabilising influence in all bright stars. Red stars don't have that luxury. Proto-Saturn's capture. This is uh, the interesting part of it. This took me decades to try and figure out because the model of planets arranged with their poles in a line is unstable. There's no Newtonian theory to explain a, a daisy chain of planets. So it eventually dawned on me that what we had was a dynamic arrangement where proto-Saturn, which is in this diagram over here, that's proto-Saturn, and you can just see a few little brighter red dots behind it. They are the Earth and Mars and other satellites. That's meant to represent those satellites. The explanation came to me once I had realised that the stabilisation of the planetary orbits as we see them today, why is the Newtonian system a clockwork system, or it appears to be a clockwork system, when you only have one force? Well, the answer is you, you cannot have a stable system with one force. There has to be a feedback mechanism. And as I explained the other day, you can change the mass of a planet or a star by either placing charge on it or taking charge away. And it occurred to me that a small star like Proto-Saturn entering the uh, environment of the Sun would suffer a drastic change in its, ex its electrical environment, with a result, actually, that Proto-Saturn would have become one gigantic comet because a body which is negatively charged with respect to its environment is a cometary body, and a body that's positively charged with its respect to its environment is an anode in the discharge, and it is a star. So this was a change, a sudden change, once proto-Saturn approached the, uh, the solar system at that time uh, closely. At least it would have uh, been most drastic once it entered the heliosphere, the boundary of the sun's environment with interstellar space. So Saturn as a comet 
is uh, removing electrons. And the result is that uh, it is losing mass, it's accelerating towards the sun. The bodies behind it, actually, I, I, sorry, I got that around the wrong way. The protosaturn itself is losing electrons, as comets do. They are being passed on to the, its satellites. The satellites are gaining in mass. Saturn is losing in mass. Conservation of energy says that uh, protosaturn accelerates towards the sun, and this is part of the electrical capture mechanism. The Earth and Mars and the other satellites gaining in mass will tend to fall behind and line up, rather like Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. The electrical discharge, the polar discharge, in my opinion then, is the central column of Saturn's cometary discharge. We were sitting in this cometary tail, right in the middle of it. And all of the plasma discharge effects that were witnessed by the ancients and chiselled into rock come from that period of capture. I've said as a cometary body, proto-Saturn loses electrons and accelerates towards the sun. All of this could explain all of the plasma phenomena, discharge phenomena, recounted by Dave Talbot and Dwight Cardona. The latest measurements by Pitieva and Standish suggest the astronomical unit is increasing about 23 feet per century. That means that the Earth is actually, its orbit is uh, shifting over time. But according to uh, the beliefs of astronomers, the astronomical unit shouldn't change at all. The mechanism I'm describing for the modification of gravity 